Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the second webinar within our series on promoting healthy food choices and physical activity in rural America Indian communities. Um, this webinar will be recorded and available uh, afterwards uh, through the um, Southwest Telehealth uh, Resource Center. Um, by the way, I'm Douglas Terran. I'm the director of the Western Region Public Health Training Center and am co-hosting this um, webinar today. Um, I also want to welcome everyone within the Western Region Public Health Training Center who's participating. The WRPHCC covers Arizona, California, Hawaii, Nevada, and the U.S. Associated Pacific Islands. And the Southwest Telehealth Regional Center uh, Resource Center also covers the similar states, but also Colorado, New Mexico, Utah. And also welcome to all the other uh, fellow HRSA grantees and all other participants from the U.S. and abroad to this webinar. Um, this webinar today is approved from continuing education credits. Um, you can receive one um, continuing education credit for nurses, uh, certified health education specialists, and for dietitians. Uh, for nursing continuing education, uh, just so you know, we have specific learning objectives for today. Um, so upon the completion of this presentation, participants will be able to identify key components for developing a university tribal partnership to address nutritional risk behaviors for children. You can be able to describe the major components and activities of a week-long health promotion curriculum. And you can explain the importance of providing interventions with a cultural context for American Indian youth. Um, for disclosure purposes and for continuing education purposes, the planners and presenters of today's webinar have no relevant financial relationships to disclose. Um, continuing nursing education information, if you want CNUs um, for nurses or CEUs for nurses, um, you, your, your um, attendance is required. You have to actually be on the training before 12.10 to, and participate in all of the training activities. Um, you also uh, need to complete the online nursing evaluation at the end of the um, webinar, and you can get this at cne.nursing.arizona.edu. Here's a few tips before we get started. Um, please um, mute your phone and or computer microphone. Um, there is time reserved at the end for questions and answers. And um, please fill out the post-webinar survey. Um, as I mentioned before, the webinar is being recorded. And recordings will be posted on the Southwest Telehealth Resource Center website, which is listed here. And you'll be able to uh, get to this website through the Public Health Training Center website, which is also um, listed. Um, by the way, um, you'll be able to type in your questions on, into the um, uh, website, and we will be uh, providing them to our presenter at the end of the webinar, and we will have a question and answer session at the end. So it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Francine Goshapin. And Dr. Goshapin is an assistant professor in the Department of Family and Community Medicine here at the College of Medicine at the University of Arizona. Uh, she is a tribal member of the Pueblo Jemez in New Mexico. Uh, she received her Doctor of Philosophy from the University of New Mexico and a Master's of Public Health and Epidemiology from the University of Washington. She studies primarily chronic diseases and related behavioral risk factors. Uh, she has worked at four separate tribal-based epidemiology centers in the Portland area, Aberdeen, uh, the Native American Research Centers in, for Health um, in um, what, one, three, four, and five, I guess those are HRSA regions, or those are, IHS regions. Those are NARCH programs. NARCH programs. Okay. Um, as the principal investigator at the U of A here in Tucson, her goals are to conduct research studies to develop and implement and evaluate behavioral interventions in American Indian tribal settings to promote healthy lifestyles. So it's my pleasure to introduce Francine for her presentation today. 
thank you so much, Dr. Turin, and thank you and welcome everyone uh, to this webinar. Uh, we appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to listen in on some of the activities that we've been doing in Indian country. And uh, the webinar was advertised under different titles, so I just put in this title slide so that you can know that you're in the right place, right? And so the things that I'd like to cover today include a little bit of background and context for why this kind of work is important. And I hope that through this presentation, it will also validate some of the work that you're doing in your own respective communities and in your workplaces as well. Uh, there are some, there are elements that I would really like to highlight um, in the different programs that we administer, um, one of them being empowering youth in regular day-to-day -day decision making, giving them options and giving them ways that they can do things to improve their own health status. And then looking at things that we do ordinarily anyway, and just trying to improve and increase the, the healthiness of the things that we're doing on a regular basis. And then mindfulness is really important. I think all of us can uh, testify that our mental health and well-being is directly correlated with how we overall feel about physical activity or about how we feel about ourselves. And so we broach on uh, mindfulness and a lot of the outreach and the education that we do with youth. And so I want to spend a few minutes talking about that. And then when we think about nutrition, which is kind of the focus of my presentation today, we don't oftentimes think about community considerations when broaching this subject. And I wanted to spend a few minutes talking just about uh, tribal community considerations when we're talking about nutrition overall. So last webinar, if you attended, Dr. Tufel Shon did an excellent job describing diabetes in Indian country. And what I'd like for you to do is to think about diabetes, but not from the adult perspective, but to think about it from the youth perspective. As I go through the different points in my presentation, how this is impacting our youth the future of our native people is really important for us to, to look from their perspective. So the likelihood of an American Indian Alaska Native youth between the ages of 10 to 19 to be diagnosed with type 2 diabetes is 1.74 per 1,000 versus 0.19 per 1,000 for non-Hispanic whites. This is a nine-fold increase. For those that are already diagnosed with diabetes among youth, for data from 1990 to 2009, for youth between the ages of 15 to 19, it rose from 3.24 per 1,000 to 6.81 per 1,000. It's doubled. And I recently attended a presentation that was conducted by the National Institute of Diabetes, Digestive Diseases, and Kidney, NIDDK, who's been a forerunner in studying diabetes in native uh, country. And what they said was the youngest documented native youth to be diagnosed with type two diabetes is three years old. And so this is astounding if you think about the trajectory of these individuals, if we don't step in to make a difference, to help them to make better choices and to really help them to promote healthy lifestyles. So risk factors, again, we're looking at this from a youth's perspective. Diabetes used to be called adult onset. That's no longer the case. We are finding more and more of these risk factors becoming evident in native youth. Uh, there are some things we can control, other things we can't. Um, if you're native, the higher the percentage of native ancestry you have, the more likely you are to develop type 2 diabetes. Strong family history. Uh, if you have a first degree relative with diabetes, the chances of you also being at risk increases. Uh, gestational diabetes is a risk factor. Having low birth weight is a risk factor. And childhood obesity is really, really critical. And it's something that we focus on in the wellness camp that I'll be describing a lot more. 
um, metabolic uh, syndrome uh, factors are really important. Hyperinsulinemia, uh, impaired glucose tolerance, acanthosis nigricans are all uh, indicators that an individual is at risk, but it doesn't uh, diagnose them. And so we, there are plenty of points where we can intervene. Um, we can focus on behavioral types of uh, interventions, which is what we do in a lot of the work that I do, looking at increasing exercise, looking at you know, improving uh, healthy eating, and then really trying to empower youth to make those differences on a daily basis. Again, looking at health impacts from a youth perspective, some of these things are readily remedied, others are much more challenging. A lot of the youth that we work with come from very challenging home environments where there is evidence of violence, where there is domestic violence, where there's abuse happening. Um, unfortunately, some on a regular, daily, ongoing basis. And so this is very stressful for the youth. As you can imagine, there are lots of socioeconomic kinds of stressors that might be evident in the home environment, things that are related to uh, financial difficulties, things that are related to employment, things that are related to education, um, which all lend to a poor quality of life and if a child is in this environment for extended amounts of time the physiological impacts can be um, devastating and then just for an individual that is not managing their diagnosis there can be other complications. We all know that in Indian country, when an individual is diagnosed with one condition, there probably are other things that they're dealing with as well that may or may not have been diagnosed as well. But if you think about this from a youth perspective, just the type of uh, treatment course that they have to be responsible to maintain is challenged because they may not have the maturity to understand what these ramifications might be long term if they don't follow the treatment regimens that are prescribed to them. And so we need to be really mindful about these as we're working with youth and trying to educate youth on these different kinds of uh, outcomes uh, if they don't really um, take responsibility for their conditions. I'm very fortunate to work with a colleague who has a lot of foresight. Um, her name is Dr. Jenny Jo. Uh, Dr. Jenny Jo is Professor Emeritus here at U of A. She's Navajo and worked for many, many years as a nurse in IHS facilities before tribes started to take over their own healthcare delivery systems. And she actually is one of the original founders of the wellness camp that I'll be talking quite a bit about during this presentation. Now, one of the things that she really strongly promotes even to this day is the importance of the strengths that we have as Native peoples, our resiliency, our shared languages, our shared norms, our shared cultural beliefs, how we care so much about community and our families, how we have very different expectations than the general population, how we really rely on our tribal and community customs regarding health promotion, and how these are really important in the programs that we design and in the interventions that we implement. And so what she did was she recognized that there were all these strengths that we had and how could we apply them in an environment that would be conducive to educating youth about really taking care of themselves and again taking responsibilities for their well-being because by educating youth we're impacting future families because these kids will grow up and they're going to have children of their own and we want for them to have the means to be able to provide for their own families long term. And so this wellness camp idea was born. And the wellness camp program really builds on cultural practices, it builds on uh, cultural philosophies, and really this shared environment that I described, all of it to facilitate health awareness and to encourage behavioral change.
And here in the slide, you see a picture of the very first wellness camp that was held. It was in 1991. And we've been very fortunate that over the duration of this wellness camp initiative, that we've had many tribes participate in many different ways, uh, sending their youth, sending their volunteers, um, helping to make this uh, actual program a reality and all time participating in tri tribes include the Colorado River Indian tribes, the Fort McDowell Yavapai, Gila River, Hopi, Wallapai, my own tribe, Hamas, Navajo, Pascoyaki, Salt River, Pima Maricopa, the San Carlos Apache, the T.O., White Mountain Apache, Yavapai Apache, Yavapai Prescott. And some of these uh, communities have been coming to camp since 1991. And so there is a true academic tribal partnership for this program. And in large part, it's due to the fact that we work together and we hear what the tribes are requesting and we utilize the expertise of the tribal personnel that come to the camp and it's a, a two-way street. Here we have a picture of our camp from this past summer. It's the 2016 Wellness Camp, and we had a record uh, 60 kids come to camp, and uh, we had um, kids come from Hopi, from Gila River, from Salt River, from Pascoyaki, from Hopi, and my tribe. And really, again, we're keeping true to the original goal of the wellness camp in really developing and utilizing a culturally and medically appropriate camp for Native youth. And one of the distinguishing factors that I think is really important for this particular program that sets it aside from community-based day-type programs is that the residential camp really removes the child from their environment and places them in a very safe, and we've taken lots of step to, steps to make this a very safe environment for the child, but it's a week where they don't have to worry about things that they typically will maybe worry about at home and they are introduced to kids from other tribes which for many is a unique experience they've not ever really met other kids from other tribes and they learn about the cultures of these different tribes that they're now uh, living with for the week they're taking they're given these uh, newfound independence where they have to make their own decisions they have to get up at a certain time go to bed at a certain time so they're given responsibility in a peer setting, which I think really supports them. Uh, we have kids that are already diagnosed with type 2 diabetes who come to the camp. And so we have medical staff available that have time to meet with them one-on-one -on -one to answer questions, to provide additional guidance, and to give additional medical advice as needed. And so it provides a resource for kids that may not be available to them on a regular ongoing basis. The instructors that we have at camp are community-based. They're coming from health programs at the respective tribal communities that I mentioned, and they're bringing their expertise, and they work with the youth on programs that they implement locally, and it's a really also good environment for our volunteers from the tribes because they learn other kinds of education modes that they may not be familiar with, and they take that back to their own home community as well and so it's sharing on multiple levels and this is something I think is a true benefit to the partnership when the kids come to camp, a typical week includes activities that are comprised of assessments, education, interactive group sessions. We do a lot of physical activity. And again, all of it is based in a cultural context. And so we actually introduce kids to a lot of tribal traditions. As we all know, um, things are evolving in tribal communities and some youth are not familiar with what are considered to be traditional kinds of activities and so here we provide a forum to introduce kids to some historical kinds of tribal traditions that they may or may not be familiar with. 
up on the very top, we see a picture of um, an assessment being done. Um, that is a picture of Dr. Helmuth, who is our camp pediatrician, and she is taking a blood pressure um, a reading on one of our participants. And so we do a whole host of biometric measures, anthropometric measures, as well as survey information, and we collect this from the kids, and we compile this information for a few reasons. The primary one is to identify kids who may be outside of medical attention that may be needing it and to make appropriate referrals. The other is to use this as baseline information to show what the um, outcomes are. As you know, in the different programs that you work with, it's very important for us to show the impact of the work that we're doing. Are we making a difference? Are our programs really getting at the targets that we're setting? And so these measures are a way for us to assess whether or not we're on the right track. And it's a way to provide feedback to the respective communities on their own youth. And so it's been very powerful. And in later slides, I'll actually give you an overview of some of these different measures and how the tribes are actually using them. So we also do nutrition and diabetes education sessions. As I mentioned, these are led by uh, program personnel from the respective tribes. And we really make them and tailor them so that they are interactive, that the kids are, are there attentive for the information that we have. We do pre-test and post post test to assess whether kids are accruing the information that we are delivering. And then a lot of the, of the activities that we promote are interactive in nature. We're trying to help kids to break out of their shells, to be uh, communicative, to be uh, involved in the different things that may be available to them. And so we provide ample opportunity for kids to work together. Um, we try to, again, uh, make it diverse so that kids are meeting as many of their peers that are attending camp as possible. We do lots of structured physical activities. These are all led by certified physical activity instructors from the tribes. And we, again, try to make these fun, interactive. And uh, here's a picture of Zumba here. Um, and then we do things like um, uh, yoga, we do uh, circuit kinds of trainings, and then we have the tribal traditions. And again, introducing kids to things that are historically native and trying to also instill native values when we are doing these different games and activities with the children. And uh, we get, we do uh, an extensive evaluation of all these things and they've been favorable to date. None of this that I'm describing would be possible without the partnership of the communities that we work with. And if any are on the call, I want to thank you for your continuing um, support of these different programs uh, because they wouldn't be possible without each of you. The, the program that we do primarily is focused on Southwest tribes, uh, and they involve from the different tribal communities, different tribal health departments, they involve the Indian Health Service. Uh, typically, many of the personnel are coming from the tribal diabetes programs, from the tribal wellness programs. We also have individuals coming from programs such as social work, from the senior program. We have individuals coming from the education programs. And we form a small planning committee that meets on a regular basis uh, well before um, the camp and actually we have our uh, first planning meeting for next summer, next week. And so we talk about the schedule, we look at the evaluations, we look at the different survey results to help us to make our uh, schedule as appropriate as possible. Um, the camp relies on volunteers um, to come to help to actually supervise the children and this is a very, uh, I think, unique opportunity even for, for individuals who come because it's an opportunity for them to be very engaged with the youth that we work with. Um, I'm continually writing grants to support this project, but the tribes really also do step in and they share the cost of the camp by um, volunteering to bring certain supplies, different equipment, and certainly the personnel is probably the most prominent and in return, as I mentioned, the, the tribes get 
aggregate aggregated the identified results and uh, this webinar is unique in that you can actually see me and so I just want to hold up a copy of the report that is on the actual um, slide that you see and this is over a hundred pages of a report that was disseminated to all the tribes and in here are all the results about all the data that we collect a lot of histograms actually showing the responses for the different questions that we're asking the kids the biometric measures that I'm going to talk about how they are um, calculated for the different um, values the variables that we're collecting at camp all the evaluations, all of these are provided, including all the instruments that we use at camp are made available in these reports that go back to the tribe. And I think these are very useful to the tribes because they can, again, use them for some of their own reporting requirements, some of the data that they're collecting at their own home communities. All of these are vital in the partnership because we're all getting the information that we need to, again, uh, justify additional funding, additional um, investment in the work that we're doing. And each of the communities are doing follow-up of the participants on an individual basis. Some are much more engaged than others. And on my part, what I'm trying to do is to uh, establish a sound funding so that I can make uh, the follow-up structured and standard across all the tribes that participate in the program. And cross your fingers that I'm successful in getting that funding. The documentation and the training that goes into the, our program is really, really important. We've actually developed a curriculum um, that is available to anybody who is interested that is participating in this webinar. And this curriculum describes many of the themes that I'm talking about here, and it uh, gives you copies of the different instruments that we're using so that you can use these as templates in the, in the different programs that you might be interested in implementing or that you may be already implementing and just need supplemental information. On the right-hand side, you see a copy of a data collection form that we use when, at the residential camp. And um, it's, it's, a, it's the form that we use. And so again, these are available to individuals if they're interested. And at the very bottom, you actually get a glimpse of the different types of trainings and the preparations that go into the work that we do. On the far left-hand side, you see a picture of us having a pre-arrival meeting where we're going through our protocols to make sure everybody's clear on the role, on their responsibilities. Here's a picture of my husband, Ivan, who is actually setting up our SICA stadiometers, getting ready for us to start collecting heights. And then in the middle picture, you see a picture of a basketball court that we've actually set up to do something called the PACER 20 meter, which is a measure of cardiovascular fitness. And then on the next slide, you see one of our students setting up the computers so that we can um, make sure that all our databases are up and running and making sure that everything is ready again for the data collection portion of our session. And then on the right hand side, you see me um, talking with some of my students about the type of data that need to be extracted to put into these reports that I mentioned. And so it's a very coordinated effort that needs a lot of detail and attention, but it's stuff that I think is easily replicable at the different communities that you may be coming from. And I was talking about youth empowerment. And a lot of times people say that information is power, right? And a lot of the work that we do is to really make the work that we're doing transparent to the children as well. And so we collect different measures on the children, including age, age, sex, height, weight. And weight is part of a more comprehensive body composition of measures that we collect. We look at glucose, both fasting and A1Cs. We do fasting total cholesterol. We actually do uh, measures on physical activity and trying to make these as objective as possible. We 
we do 24 hour dietary recalls with the children. We do three measures, two on regular weekdays, one on the weekend day. Uh, and we do these before cat and after cat. And these are ways to really assess, again, are we making a difference? And the different messaging that we're giving on nutrition, are the kids really incorporating them in their, their home life? And then we do a very extensive youth risk behavior and resiliency survey. And uh, th these are getting at things that might be challenging or that may be facilitators for you. And for us, it's a way to know how best to message the things that we're trying to promote with the children. And on the slides that you see, the pictures on these slides that you see, those are actual um, attendees and the different activities that we're doing at camp. And so these are results from this past summer. Again, we have the height, the weight, and what you're seeing on these slides are the number that you see is the average. We've taken all the kids and we took all their heights, and this is the average height of all the kids. And then in the parentheses, we have the range, the, the lowest value to the highest value. And you can see that some of these data are very informative. We have a child between the ages of 10 to 15, for example, example was 281 pounds and so the weight by itself tells us that there are uh, issues that probably need to be addressed. We, on the body composition that I, met, I mentioned, we collect uh, percent fat, uh, body fat mass, lean body mass, body mass index. And this is information that we're communicating to the youth, explaining about their body and what these different measures are telling us. We also are communicating this information to the prior uh, providers at the different communities in the event that there's some sort of medical follow-up that needs to happen, we're also making this data available to the parents. And again, alerting the parents that there might be some uh, additional uh, medical attention that the child needs. On the very bottom, you can't see, see the uh, slides too well, but I hope you see the colors. This is a way that we are illustrating where the kids fall in terms of their body mass index. Body mass index has traditionally been used as a way to measure where kids are at in terms of normal weight, if they're overweight, if they're obese. And on this slide, we actually break down obesity into categories of obesity one, obesity two, obesity three, with three being um, the most severe. And from these slides, if you can see the little dots on there, we have the majority of our youth falling above the red line, which means this, these are above the 95th percentile. These are where we should be seeing kids below that, not above that. And for our Native youth, we're seeing the majority above that. And the, the, the picture on the left is for females, the one on the right is for males, and you can see that the males are actually exhibiting severe obesity much more than the, the girls are. We also take blood pressure, heart rates, waist circumference, A1Cs, fasting cholesterol, fasting glucose. And you can see again, uh, if we look at the A1C measure, that we have individuals that are calculating coming in at 11.1, .1, fasting cholesterol being at 258. So these are again measures that we need to pay attention to. And then one of the things that we implemented a couple of years ago is using technology. Um, the kids love this. Um, but one of the things that's uh, prohibitive is that you have to have enough funds to buy this type of equipment. But I'm sure many of you have heard of, for example, the Fitbit. And in this illustration, we actually are using something called the polar loop, but essentially it's a wrist accelerometer. It's measuring your activity for you. And one of the things that's really important when we talk about health promotion is sleep, to encourage sleep among the youth, especially the youth because their bodies are growing and they need that time for their bodies to really do the functioning and the resynchronization that it needs to do. But but what we did was we gave kids wrist accelerometers and for the week that we had them we were able to download all their information and um, it became much more sporadic once they left the camp 
But for the week that they were there, we were able to document on a daily basis and download their information. And here you see an illustration of the data that we collected on day two of camp. And for the active time that was tracked by the risk accelerometers, it was an average of nine hours that the kids were active. And if you look at the range, even for the child that was the least active, they were still active for almost five hours. And it's recommended that we take 10,000 steps per day. The average for our kids was 27,781. And again, even for the child that was least active, they surpassed the 10,000 by 3,000, which is tremendous. And for the device that we used, um, they're set up for individuals. It's based on your age, your, your, um, your biometric measures, your height, your weight, all of that is calculated into the device. And so it gives you your own daily goal. And with the device that we had, if you met your goal, it did fireworks. And the kids were so excited about this. The kids would run up to you and show you their device and say, look, look, it's somebody getting fireworks. And they would get so excited about this. And so there was immediate feedback, even for the kids, and it just motivated them to continue their physical activity. And this was so heartwarming to, to witness and to see the kids being empowered and knowing that they were making a difference for themselves. And when you sync the device on the website, you could see on a daily basis an actual clock of the physical activity, and that's what you're seeing on the slide at the bottom. This is a 24-hour a, a clock with zero, 00 at the top um, uh, coinciding with midnight. And this is a day in the life of Francine. And so this is actually one of my days at camp. And the blue actually shows you the times that I was active. The darker the color, the more intense my physical activity was. And so at the very bottom, you can see how much time I spent sleeping, um, sitting, walking, uh, walking briskly and really exerting energy full, full, fully. And so it actually breaks up my day according to the intensity of my physical activity and you're able to calculate how much of that was intensive physical activity. And so very powerful information and I think it gives us a lot to work on if you're able to afford to incorporate this on a community, at the community level. So specific to nutrition, um, which I think is really important for work that is being done, um, is we use different um, existing um, systems that are out there and we promote my plate and so we actually devise the menu for the week with my plate in mind so all the meals that are served are trying to promote not only the messaging but actually when the kids see their plate at camp these are the distributions that we actually serve the food in and so it's again a reinforcement of the education by actually doing that on a meal by meal basis. We have registered dietitians who work with our program and they're the ones who actually design our menu. Um, they're the ones who actually do the calorie counts of the foods. They make sure that we're following the recommendations. And I think it's tremendous that we have this resource. And I think if you're doing nutrition at your community levels, it's really important to involve their expertise because they can help you to really incorporate some of these in the work that you're doing. We do a lot of messaging and in the middle you see the numbers 85210 and this is our camp zip code. And again, I mentioned earlier that sleep is so important and so we promote with the kids that they get eight hours of sleep per day. Um, the five is for five fruits and vegetables per day. The two is the limit that we should place on kids for screen time, whether that's television, their smartphones, their tablets, whatever it may be, but trying to limit that to two hours per day at most, especially on a school day. And then the one is for an hour of physical activity per day, 60 minutes of really uh, uh, 
increasing your heart rate. And then the zero is for no sugar beverages. We know that there are lots of um, uh, sugar beverages in our environments, uh, soda, Kool-Aid, Gatorade, uh, energy drinks. And so we're trying to promote drinking water to the kids and that water be their uh, choice of beverage. We do a lot of lessons that are getting at energy in, energy out, and trying to have the kids understand um, when they're eating a food that it takes certain amount of energy to really expend the calories that you're consuming and for them to be mindful about the calories that come in some of their uh, daily foods that they're eating, um, chips, for example. So a, um, a hot fr fries or whatever kids may be eating, nachos. Uh, and so uh, we try to really promote the, this education with the children so that they understand all of these different things that can be done on an individual basis for them to make good decisions. We do exercises. Um, some of them are like slow go woe foods. This is an education program that we have that the kids really, really liked. And so we show them uh, foods that are commonly consumed and we put them into categories on whether or not it's a go food or if it's a slow food or if it's a woe food. And the woe foods are foods that you should eat very um, sparingly and not on a regular basis. The woe foods are foods that, you know, are tempting and they're okay, but maybe once a week. And the go foods are foods that are really good for you that you should really be eating on a regular ongoing basis. And so um, we do these different activities with the kids so that uh, when we show them that they have to answer whether it's go slow or woe foods. And then we also uh, have snacks throughout our camp, and we actually have the kids participate in making their own snacks. And so they actually are the ones um, make, putting their food together, and so it gives them some ownership in um, the schedule that we have at camp, and I think that really goes over well. We also have um, sessions that look at the, um, if, if for example, this is one that Jessica does, um, and uh, Jessica is one of our um, uh, wellness programs up from Hopi, and what she does is we're going on a road trip, which is true for many tribal communities because to go to the grocery stores over an hour away, and so if you're going on a road trip and you have a choice of what to take with you, what are you going to choose? But when you choose it, let's calculate the number of calories it has, the amount of sugar that it has, the amount of salt that it has, and being mindful about the, the choices that you're going to be making on this road trip. And so here are some slides of, um, that we have that we took at camp. And here we're learning about sugar content, about foods. And same thing, we bring in a lot of empty um, foods that kids are familiar with. And we have them actually say, you know, are you familiar with this food? And would you like to calculate to see how much sugar is in this food? And so the kids actually go through and read the food label and they calculate the amount of sugar in the different foods. And here you see a number of slides where the kids are showing us their favorite food and how much sugar it has. And then you also see on these pictures uh, measuring cups and measuring spoons. And so these we actually give to the kids to keep and to take home so that we're providing, again, these tools for the kids to actually be using when they go back home. And so these, go, these lessons really do go over well, and I think the kids get the message. And many of them are astounded by the amount of sugar or fat or salt that are in these foods that um, they just love to eat. And so it makes them think twice about the portioning next time they eat their favorite foods. This is a copy of our menu. You don't need to worry about the details. The things that I do want for you to take from this is that, again, we're trying to make these food items as close to my plate as possible, but also that we offer snacks for 
the day. We offer a morning snack, we offer a, a mid-morning snack, an afternoon snack, an evening snack, and this is in addition to breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And the important thing about this is that we try to keep, teach kids to eat healthy snacks when they're when, when before they're hungry because when you're hungry you're going to eat whatever food is around you and it may or may not be the most nutritious and so trying to again teach the kids about energy in and not making it so that your energy is so low that you're going to eat whatever food source is, is nearby and what we do on our evaluations is we actually ask kids about what their favorite food was at camp. We also ask them what was their least favorite. Um, but it was very validating for us to see that the kids' favorite foods are the eggs with the vegetables. Because we're not giving the kids just scramble eggs, we're actually adding vegetables to the eggs. And so this is what I was meaning when you take the ordinary and you introduce something. Um, and so the eggs then come with vegetables and it's really nice to see that the kids liked it. And so hopefully if they like it, they can then implement that at their home and thereby increasing their intake of fruits and vegetables per day. And then things like pizza with the vegetables. And so we're uh, again modifying the meal so that they're low in salt, fat, sugar content. And again, uh, here we hear from the kids that they're liking the foods that we're introducing them to. And we also, when we um, serve the meals to the kids, we have certain meals where the registered dietitians actually talk with the kids and talk with them about how the food was prepared so that they know that the meat that they're eating is a reduced fat or that we've substituted uh, for the tacos, for example, we're offering uh, um, tacos that are not made of beef or if they're beef they're low fat beef but also that we're introducing uh, chicken tacos for example something that may be substituted and then I was talking about mindfulness and just how important it is for us to include mental health in all the things that we're doing and this is one question that we have on our youth risk behavior survey and we ask the kids when you're eating dinner at home how often is a television on while you're eating? And it's very um, warming, a uh, heartwarming to see that uh, one fifth um, of the kids say never, that they never watch TV while they're eating. But we have about 62% of the kids say that it's sometimes, most of the time, we're always that they have the television on and the thing about this is if you're watching television you're not really paying attention to what's in front of you and you're just kind of eating and you're eating and you're eating and you're not thinking about the volume of the foods that you're eating that are in front of you and so what we promote with the kids is to really pay attention to what they're eating how does it taste how does it smell how does it make you feel and so that kids have a connection with the food that they're eating beyond just putting it in your mouth, that kids appreciate the tastes of the, the food, the, the way that um, it smells, and really trying to promote mindfulness eating among the kids and trying to uh, eliminate external um, things that may just be distracting from that mindfulness. Uh, one of the exercises that we also do with the kids is really trying to have them articulate what they do when they're stressed and trying to identify whether or not food is a comfort food, that kids are using food for comfort and trying to substitute that with other ways of coping with how they might be feeling and so we incorporate that in our curriculum as well and this is just a slide to underscore that the, the work that we're doing is communicated on all levels with the tribes that are participating that the results that we find um, if they're medically um, needing attention we make sure that those are referred and that um, when we do do these referrals, however, we are mindful that sometimes at the community, the resources may not be readily available and that we have to really implement a multidisciplinary approach for many of the things that I'm um, talking about today. And we're almost out of time. I want to allow some uh, question time, but I did want to finish my presentation with just tribal community considerations when we're talking about uh, nutrition. 
And a lot of the times we don't think about how nutrition has been impacted by the historical traumas that Native communities have experienced. And I think we need to be mindful about that. Um, because of development, for example, many areas that were natural for hunting and gathering are no longer there. Uh, those food sources have been either compromised or completely de depleted. And so those are, I think, travesties that we deal with on a daily basis when we're coming from tribal communities. This is a picture of corn, and from where I come from, corn is essential for a lot of our food source. It's a main uh, food source for us, but also there are many ceremonial connections to the food that we consume. Foods can be prepared only at certain times of the year. They have to have special uh, training in some instances. Some have very direct religious connections. And so if you're working with tribal communities on nutrition, you have to be mindful that some of these things may not be readily shared with you. This data is probably not for entry into big public uh, nutrition databases. I know it's important for us to really try to get nutrient content of some foods, but some foods may be so sacred that they're not available for this type of um, information gathering. And so when you work in tribal communities, you need to be mindful about those sorts of things. And in establishing partners with partnerships with tribes, these are the sorts of things that I think they can help you with. And the more trust and respect there is between um, you as the individual who's working with tribal communities and the tribal community itself, um, the more you may know about these sorts of um, considerations that need to be made. And I think it's really important for us to think about nutrition, not only in the aspects that I've mentioned, but also in these different religious and community-based perspectives. And so those are all the slides that I had. And in closing, I want to thank Dr. Jenny Jo. Again, she's largely responsible for setting up these different programs. We've done a lot of outcomes measures in the last few years, but we're building on this cultural base that I mentioned. Uh, Dr. Dave Alberts from the Arizona Cancer Center has been very supportive of this work and without funding from the Cancer Disparities Program, we would not have all the equipment and the supplies that we have as um, being able to measure all these different biometric and anthropometric measures that were mentioned. Dr. Sally Real from the Arizona AHEC has been so supportive of our work and has provided funding these last several years, including students. Um, students help us with the different projects and the programs that I described. And in large part, the funding has come from Dr. Real. I work with a colleague, Dr. Susan Reset from Washington University in St. Louis, who actually came out to uh, camp this past summer and she's helping us with a lot of again these outcome measures that we're um, establishing and funding for these different programs is so imperative the participation of the Indian youth and the participants the parents we couldn't I mean, we do this for you and so uh, I want to acknowledge them and thank them for participating the tribal partners that I mentioned are integral to everything that we're doing and we've been very fortunate to receive funding from the Partnership of Native Americans, the Mayo Clinic Spirit of Eagles, Desert Diamond Casinos, um, the Diabetes Action Research and Education Foundation, the Cancer Disparities Program here at EOA, um, the Arizona Area Health Education Centers Program, as I mentioned, and Marin Community Foundation. Um, they've all been um, great at providing ongoing support. And if you have any questions or anything beyond today, um, here's some contact information for me. I'm at fcgotchipin at email.arizona.edu. And then my phone number, 520-621-5072. And I appreciate the opportunity to share with you the work that we're doing. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gotchipin. We do have several questions for you, by okay. the way. Okay, great. Um, one, so I'm going to do one at a time, and okay. you can give short answers. Okay. Because Otherwise, we may not get to them all. The other thing to remember is 
um, we can post answers to the questions afterwards onto the website too. So the first question is, um, do you have return campers? And uh, how do you engage uh, campers um, who do not return? Or how do you engage campers after the camp? So um, we do have kids that return to camp. And uh, from year to year, we usually have about 15% of the kids who come back to camp. And for each of the different communities, the way that they follow up with the kids really differs. And I'm going to um, give Hopi as an example, and I hope this is okay with them. But at Hopi, for the kids who go to the residential camp, they actually have a regular established ongoing meeting time with the kids that came to camp and their parents. And they do this for six months. And for my part, overall, what I do is I have a mailing list. And so we send all the reports that I mentioned to the parents and to the youth uh, what well, we have this exercise with the kids where they make a promise to themselves and so what I do at Christmas time is I send all the kids a Christmas card and I enclose their promise and I ask them what they've done to keep their promise to themselves and so there are ongoing uh, activities and I said my goal is to really do um, follow-up assessments with the children very similar to how we do our baseline it's just that I've not secured funding to be able to do that as yet but that's one of my goals the next question was how do you measure um, body composition and how is it compared with DEXA so uh, our body composition we use a uh, Tanita body composition scales and so it's a foot-to-foot -foot measure so um, it sends a little um, signal through the body and so we use this for our body composition measures and the, the way that it uh, compares with DEXA is the price difference for one <laughs> um, but the other is uh, I understand now that DEXA is portable before it didn't used to be quite so portable and all the work that we do is out of the field at our campsite and so we do need equipment that is versatile and easy to be portable and so that was one thing that really set aside the Tanita from something like the deck um, by the way where is the camp located so the camp that we have right now is located in Prescott Arizona up in the mountain Prescott mm -hmm. Mountains, and which is actually the homelands to the Yavapai Apache um, another question is um, with the activity trackers were they bought or do donated and are the children able to take the activity trackers home to keep using them after the camp? So yes, the uh, trackers were bought by our program and I'm trying to establish partnerships with others so that they may be potentially donated because they're not cheap. They're like $120 each. And so yes, the kids were able to keep them when they left the camp. That's wonderful. Yes, yes. Um, the next question about nutrition is, um, does the nutrition program uh, focus on traditional foods and how traditional foods can be incorporated into the diet? Yes, and I neglected to measure that. I apologize for that. But as part of our uh, nutrition activities, we actually do traditional meals. And we uh, actually, uh, this past summer, for example, we actually had uh, traditional foods that one of our uh, instructors taught the kids on, how to do this at home um, using uh, blue corn, for example. And so the kids actually were able to see traditional foods being prepared and were able to eat that as one of their snacks. Um, two more questions before we finish mm -hmm. up. Um, one is, what are some of the most common questions and issues that the kids have when they are at the camp? So it depends on, I think, the circumstance and the situation. Um, but a lot of it is just routine. And after the first couple of days, kids get into the swing of where they need to be at what time. Um, those typically come up. Um, and I think just... Uh, I, it's very clear. It's explained very clearly at the onset what the purpose of the camp are, and I think a lot of most of the tribes before they come to camp, they do an orientation session, so the kids are familiarized with what they can expect when they get to camp, and so I think that helps with a lot of the acclimation and our activities. Um, but I think um, kids are pretty uh, well versed in what needs to happen. And then the final question is. Um, 
you mentioned you provide information back to the parents about mm -hmm. the results of the mm -hmm. compositions and mm -hmm. the diets. Mm -hmm. Are there any other interactions that you have with the parents of the campers, especially about um, maybe the behavioral changes that were taught to the children during the camp so they can take that back to the parents? Sure. I just mentioned that many of the tribes have orientation mm -hmm. sessions. Many of the tribes also have post-camp meetings with the parents where they share um, the overall experience of the camp and um, if they have their meetings much later because usually it takes me a while to compile my final report but we make that um, available to the parents if they're interested as well we provide nutrition information back to the parents as well mm -hmm. and so um, they get a couple mailings from us um, and so the 24-hour dietary recalls for example they're aware that the kids participated in this so we knew use uh, a software we're called Nutritionist Pro and so once we enter all the information to Nutritionist Pro it actually comes back and it calculates it according to vitamins uh, to protein all the different kinds of categories and so we're able to send that back to the parents now when the different communities do their post cap Orient meetings with the um, tr uh, with the um, parents a lot of the information that you just, just said is shared back with the parents well thank you um, we are uh, out of time. I do want to provide um, some other information to everyone. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is um, the second of a four-part series of uh, webinars on um, successful nutrition programs for Native American and Pacific Islander communities. Um, on the um, screen now, you see the dates for the next two webinars. The next one will be on November 8th. It will be led by Dr. Rachel Novotny, who's at the University of Hawaii. And um, she'll be presenting her their children's healthy living program, which is being conducted in the U.S. Associated Pacific Islands. And our final presentation will be on November, uh, December 13th, um, by Dolores Addison, a dietitian with the Pasquayaki Diabetes Program. And you can get the updated information on the links shown below. Um, again, if you want to receive your continuing education credits for nursing. Um, please go to cne.nursing.arizona.edu and fill out um, the evaluation that is at that site. Finally, um, one other piece is if you um, please go to the link on this slide um, and complete the form to receive certification for your um, continuing education for um, health um, education and for um, dietitians and you need to fill out the form at this website. Um, now, as always, uh, we uh, value your opinion uh, about our webinar series, and please take a few minutes to complete the online survey that will be on the SurveyMonkey that's uh, provided here. Um, one final um, comment for me is I greatly appreciate the support we get from uh, the Health Resources and Services Administration, HRSA, through the uh, grants that support both the uh, Southwest uh, Telehealth uh, Resource Center and the funding we get from the, um, for the uh, Western Region Public Health Training Center. And this concludes the webinar for today. Uh, thank you.